Let's just give it a little finish for a moment. Melody by Sid Richardson and for Kim Duncan. Okay, so we are past the autumnal equinox, so how do I play a little something about autumn for a little bit? See yeah, if for this is going to make a change for my wrist. I'm playing a lion and healy live. Lion Hill, not Lion and Hilly, Prado Lever 40 Clark. Okay, Here we go. Closer to winter, and it feels like winter. I'm gonna head over to winter. By the Baldi. Music by Vivaldi and arranged by Jennifer Eklund. 
And so, major. by Kim Robertson. Sleep soon in the morning. Hi, Kim. Yeah. 
Um, I, my, it looks like it just turned to uh, 730. Thank you so much for your concert. We <laughs> really do appreciate it. Um, oh, so much for having me. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Um, this is now the wonderful month of November. Can you believe that the year 2022 is coming rapidly to a close? Um, I'm uh, Barbara Toy. I'm the current president of the club, and I welcome you to our uh, general meeting. Um, in case you have forgotten, uh, this is our own, our very own election season, and um, we have not exactly had a deluge of people contacting us about wanting to run. Today is your last opportunity. So please, uh, if you are interested in joining the board, which is a wonderful body of people, um, please get your name to Alan Smallbone and he can add you to the uh, ballot. And uh, we may be welcoming you to the board uh, for the next year. Um, as I said, today is the last day. Um, you just have to be a member in good standing and have been a member for a year to qualify to be a trustee, um, uh, to run for a trustee, uh, you have to have also served a year on the board if you want to run for the position of president or vice president. Anyway, um, if you don't have Alan's uh, email address, you can easily find it on the website or the back of the series Astronomer. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. The other thing I'd like to mention is that um, we are planning to have our first hybrid meeting next month. Uh, that will be the December meeting. Uh, Tim Hogel will be our speaker. Um, he is going to be speaking about Voyager, which as those of you who know Tim and have um, seen him over the years, you know that he has very, very special uh, knowledge about Voyager. He worked on that project for most of his career, I think. Um, and it, it should be a really exciting talk. And what's even more exciting, or I won't say more exciting, but close to it, is that we will actually have people on the ground at Chapman University. Um, and that will be where he will be speaking from. Um, however, if you can't make it to Chapman, um, we are also going to have it on Zoom. So that's what we mean by having a hybrid meeting. And so Raisa will be, as usual, hosting the Zoom portion of it. Um, and uh, the, the others of us will be on the ground. And we are, are hoping that we will be able to unite both the people that are there physically and the people that are attending remotely to make it a really special club experience. So we look forward to seeing you in December. And um, with that, I think it's time to turn it over to our announcement crew, and Kyle Graham is joining us again. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, let's get this started. Um. All right. Celia, are you guys starting tonight? Yeah. Um, okay. Welcome new members. We hope you enjoy this meeting and you enjoy all the new perks that you get. Yeah. Oops. Okay, so the start part is to be determined. Thank you so much. And we are having some on ground activities already. As you can see here, November 18 is the next one at the Heritage Museum. We have a board meeting this weekend in case you want to come in and try on for size the trustee position that you're going to get next year. Um, by the way, if I can interrupt, actually, the OS, uh, the ANZA Star Party will be the uh, over Thanksgiving weekend. Um, so if uh, if you are interested in attending then, I don't know how many people will want to brave the cold and, and so on, but we're hoping at least maybe we'll have clear skies over that weekend. Hope to see you there. Uh, we will be posting about the Orange County Star Party when we get those dates. All right, and it looks like uh, additionally with the astrophysics uh, group, they're meeting at the Heritage Museum, and then any other stuff you can either see here, and you can always check the calendar online for more. Leadership elections, uh, Barbara talked about this extensively, but here's just a slide, again, detailing that, and Alan Smallbone's email is down there on the bottom if you need it. 
And uh, as was the case last year, uh, the voter information will come out soon on the website and you'll be receiving an email to uh, vote online if you wish to do that. And you may additionally still send in your ballot as previously through the regular mail and it will be in the December issue of the Serious Astronomer. Okay, so for all outreach events, we are currently looking for volunteers for um, our outreach events. So please, if you're interested in any way, please contact Cecilia Cavier. The uh, Adopt Scope program, uh, that information is on the website now under the resources tab. And then once you go under resources, click on adopt the scope. There you can see a you know paragraph with information about the program. You can look at the adoption agreement and the policies of that as well as download the current inventory to see what scopes are currently available. If you are interested in putting any item uh, in the Sirius Astronomer newsletter, please send the information to Dave Fisher and he'll review the items. The newsletter, as always, is always being delivered to everyone's home by default uh, via regular mail. But if you wish to opt out of receiving a paper copy, please email Charlie. Please remember, uh, Anza, to keep your weeds clear if you have a pad out there and please help at any of the common areas if you happen to be out there and are able to do so. My name is Galileo, and um, today is going to be a waning given. Yeah. Hopefully, you guys see a beautiful name today. Oh. Bye bye. And then the uh, next general meeting is December 9th, and the WhatsApp presentation will be next. Thank you. Um, before we uh, go to the WhatsApp presentation, I forgot to mention a very important item for the uh, December meeting. Um, as I said in the president's message, um, and I've mentioned in an email on the OC Astronomers um, uh, email group, we're having a problem with Chapman uh, University. Uh, they need us to have insurance um, to uh, in in case there are instances of uh, of minor abuse. Uh, that is abuse of minors uh, related to our club events uh, at Chapman. And we are in the process of trying to find such a policy, which is not easy uh, for a club of our nature. Um, so if you have any information about policies that we should look at or what other clubs uh, organizations have done to deal with this, um, unfortunately, uh, um, difficult social problem that is is really uh, affecting a lot of organizations these days, please contact either Charlie or me um, directly. Uh, and in the meantime, until we're able to get an insurance policy, we cannot have any minors, that is nobody under age 18, can attend our general meetings at Chapman, and that's by direction of Chapman itself. Um, so we're hoping we can get that resolved before too long. But um, until we can get such a policy, we will have to enforce that um, policy against having minors at the general meeting. Minors, of course, can attend remotely. Um, and um, so at least they don't have to be excluded entirely. Um, we're really sorry that this has come up. It has uh, been a real surprise to us. Um, but we are working on it and, and hope to have a resolution before too long. Thanks. And now for what's up. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll uh, I'll jump on in. Thank you, and uh, we'll see if I can remember how to do all these things. Boy, it's sure exciting. Think about seeing you all in person again. Um, okay, let's uh, jump over to my slides. I guess you are seeing my slides. Let us go in and see what we can find in the sky. Um, as far as what's going on in the sky, let's take a quick jump around the November skies. Uh, starting with the moon, as we always do, uh, we had the full moon on November the 8th, uh, and it was lined up such that it was a lunar eclipse. Unfortunately, if a lot of us were clouded out, some only got glimpses, um, but uh, it'll be a little while till it happens again. Uh, there are usually lunar eclipses about every six months, 
The problem is for the next several of them, we're going to be on the wrong side of the earth to see it. So if you didn't catch this one, there'll be a little break before we see them again. Um, as Galileo noted, we've got a, uh, a waning gibbous moon, the position of the moon shown in purple there, uh, swinging around towards no November 16, which is last quarter moon. That's the half lit moon you see uh, at sunrise in the morning skies. Then we have the dark of the moon, uh, November 23rd. And we round out the month, November 30, with the moon returning to our evening skies, uh, half lit, convenient time for those of you who like to look at the moon, as I do. Um, planets, couple things. Venus and Mercury have returned to the evening sky. They've appeared very low in the west, meaning invisibly low in the west. You don't want to be looking at them. They've just slid back from behind the sun, um, but they're both going to appear in our skies. Now, the amount of time that they spend in our skies is different based on how fast these planets move. Mercury will be up sooner uh, in the end of December, around December 22nd. It'll swing out to its farthest away from the sun as we see it in the uh, evening elongation. Um, right now, you can't see it yet. Same for Venus. Uh, Venus is down there in the sun's uh, glare. Uh, it's going to swing up, but Venus swings much, much higher and farther away from the sun and also moves slower in its orbit. So if you like Venus, get used to it. Venus won't be at its farthest swung out from the sun until late May. So Venus is going to be a fixture in your evening skies for a long time. Watch for it over the next several months. Mars is the big news. Mars is coming to opposition on December 8th. It is at its best. You need to look at Mars now, definitely. We pass Mars every two and a half years or 2.2 years, and this is one of those times. Okay, So we want to check it out. Jupiter is uh, brilliant all night long. Um, it is uh, at its highest at 825 in the evening. Uh, so it's with you constantly. It really it doesn't set until uh, almost 2.30 in the mornings right now. So Jupiter is also a, a star attraction. Now Saturn, of course, everyone wants to see Saturn. Um, Saturn is available for you. I uh, just want to make a note, that's in the first part of your evenings after the sky gets good and dark. Saturn's nice and high when the sky gets dark about 6 p.m., but then it starts arcing on down. So you want to catch Saturn in the first couple of nights, uh, first couple hours of the night. Uh, Uranus is very well placed uh, at its highest just around midnight. Uh, so it's just at its absolute best in the constellation of Aries. Neptune is well placed but one caution, it's near Jupiter, uh, a few degrees away from Jupiter in constellation Aquarius. Um, it's at its highest at 8.02. Now, you want to catch it when it's fairly high above the horizon. Unlike Jupiter, which is blazing away, Neptune requires a telescope to see, and it's on its way down after 8.02. You've got another hour or two to catch it, but try for around 8 o'clock p.m. because it's a fainter target. Uh, Pluto, talking of fainter targets, is, of course, uh, very faint, and it's really too close to the sun to see uh, in a conveniently dark sky right now. We need that for Pluto, so it's not Pluto time right now. I mentioned that we pass Mars every 2.2 years. At the top of the diagram, you see where we're going to pass Mars. Next opposition is where Mars will be December 8, uh, and the Earth is the blue dot closest to it there. Um, some oppositions or passes of Mars are better than others because Mars's orbit is significantly eccentric. Sometimes we pass it when we are in a closer position to it, and sometimes we pass it when Mars was farther away. This is an in-between time. So Mars will be very good, better than usual, but not as big or as bright as it can ever get. Um, here's a view of Mars tonight, seen through the wonders of Starry Night Pro. A um, couple things to notice. First of all, uh, this pass with Mars, we're going to be looking at the Martian equator. So it's pretty much an equatorial pass. Neither of the poles tilted towards or away from us. If you do catch Mars tonight, uh, look for the big volcanoes of the Tharsis bulge. That's visible for the next couple of nights. 
Um, I mentioned Mars is getting larger, of course, in the sky. That's because we're getting closer to it. It is also a lot brighter than usual. In fact, it's the second uh, brightest of the planets we can see. Remember, Venus is hiding in the glare. Um, Mars is a magnitude minus 1.4, I think, right now in brightness. It's really, really bright and obvious in the constellation Taurus. Charts to follow in a moment. Uh, we got the Leonid meteors. Uh, they go all the way from the 14th to the 21st of the month. Uh, they're going to be peaking November 17 and 18 with a special caution. There might be, I believe it's a Russian astronomer predicted, there may be a special blip of activity on the 19th. Uh, so keep your eyes out for these meteors late at night after the constellation of Leo is above the horizon. Looking at the stars here, this is 6 p.m. We don't normally associate 6 p.m. with a starry condition, but our clocks have been set back, and of course there are more hours of darkness than there usually are with the approach of winter. If you look at 6 p.m., uh, looking down to the bottom of the diagram, we see a bright object down there, which is the planet Saturn at its highest. I told you, got to catch it early once it gets good and dark. Uh, the brightest dot on the chart, uh, as yet unlabeled, is Jupiter. Uh, at this early stage in the evening, you can still see the triangle, the summer triangle of the stars Deneb, Vega, and Altair just starting to set into the west. Now, as your evening progresses, uh, you'll be watching some of these things move, especially Jupiter and Saturn. Saturn at its best at six, but when we let a couple hours go by, you'll see why you wanted to catch Saturn early. Looking at 9 p.m., not all that late, but three hours into a dark night at this time of year, Saturn is already well on its way down. See why we had to catch it early? And Jupiter is at its best. So 9 p.m., Jupiter well, well above the horizon. And you've already been distracted by that beautiful moon that Galileo pointed out, um, has risen in the east there. Uh, and right next to it, Mars blazing away. You may be startled, actually, to look at 9 p.m., glance over there and see how bright Mars really is. Uh, as far as starry objects looking out into the constellations, um, just about exactly straight overhead is the square of Pegasus. Um, and we have the constellation of Andromeda, which is like a, a trail of stars leading off to the east away from that great square. Um, we have a famous object there that we'll have to give uh, some lip service to, the great Andromeda galaxy, M31. Uh, I'm actually not going to focus on that this month, uh, but I am going to give it lip service, and at the end, I will show a picture of M31. It's kind of obligatory. There it is, zoomed in slightly, and you can see it really is just about exactly straight up. Um, it has a connection to the constellation I'm going to talk about, which is Cassiopeia. Um, Cassiopeia, of course, um, we all know what Cassiopeia looks like. It's got a distinctive uh, W pattern or M, depending on which way you're standing. Um, for me, uh, this is what Cassiopeia looks like. It's why I'm an especially fond of this constellation. I make no apologies. It was 1978. I was 12 years old, impressionable, and I will always love this constellation, um, even if it just looks like this. Uh, just some little dots, uh, but they are a distinctive uh, group of dots. Um, they're supposed to be the throne of the Queen Cassiopeia, who was vain and really into herself. And so the Greeks said the gods made her circle the celestial pole half the time, turning her throne upside down. For me, it's just a big W or, or an M uh, type pattern. Um, it's actually small as constellations go. And it's fairly bright. I like that. It's convenient. Everything's packed into a fairly small area in Cassiopeia. And because of the distinctive shape, it's easy to find. And there's a lot to find in it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about stars, star clusters, nebulae, and yes, even galaxies in Cassiopeia the Queen. Let's start out with stars. Uh, we've got that uh, W pattern of stars. Two of them are favorites of mine because they're multiple stars. In particular, the one that looks like it's marked by the little letter N, that's actually Greek eta, uh, is one of the easiest, prettiest uh, double stars to see in the sky. It's, it's a fun one, and it's one of the sun's nearby neighbors as well. 
Um, you'll see we have uh, beta, then alpha, gamma, delta, and then epsilon re reading through the W to your left. Go a little farther, though, outside the W, and you come to one marked above the letter uh, uh, S in Cassiopeia there. It looks like the letter I. That's Iota Cassiopeia, and that's a well-known triple star, a very pretty one. Looking at Eta Cassiopeia, as I mentioned, it's one of our nearby neighbor suns in the universe, only 18 light years away. And the sun, the brighter sun there, is a lot like ours. So it's a very interesting star system. It has a red dwarf companion, and these are easily split, split in small telescopes. Iota Cassiopeia is a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, the brightest star there is magnitude 4.6. That's not a problem for an amateur telescope, but the companions there, if you look at the distances there, um, they are in a, a little group there that isn't that much bigger than the planet Uranus in your telescope. So it's a tight group. To look at. So I recommend uh, having a look for Iota Cassiopeia if you want a challenge. I'm feeling like less of a challenge, Eta Cassiopeia is nice and easy. Um, now moving to star clusters shown here in yellow. Cassiopeia is famous for its star clusters. They're slung all along. I'll start by mentioning the most famous of them, M52 from the Messier catalog. M52 is the brightest of them and is easily found by going to the end of the W and stars alpha to beta, looks like A and B on your chart, uh, just extend from alpha out to beta, same direction, about the same distance, and that will lead you right to M52. People who are nitpicky will notice I have included uh, NGC 869 and 884 technically over the border in Perseus. But if you're in the area of this majestic and beautiful pair of open clusters, you need to see it as well. But there are some on there like NGC 457, 7789. You might not have caught those, but they're right there close to the pattern of Cassiopeia. So I recommend you try them. Um, here is uh, M52, uh, glorious, bright, and obvious. Um, here's an exotic one, an NGC 129. Now, it's a small clustering of stars. Uh, my friend David Nakamoto from Griffith Observatory uh, shot this picture of it. Uh, that one's a little bit darker and mysterious, but uh, here's another one. Uh, this one is uh, 457, I believe. Here's one I bet you haven't seen before, 63, very pretty. 7789 is a neat one. Uh, it's a whole swarm of fainter stars. Uh, so it's uh, not really bright stars, but lots of them. It's a big star cluster with fainter stars. And then here is, yes, technically over the border in Perseus, the double cluster. If you have trouble finding any of those others in Cassiopeia, just slide slightly over to the east and have a look at this one. This is really spectacular. Now, I promised some other kinds of things. We have a nebulosity. In it. There are a number of uh, faint nebulosities scattered all around Cassiopeia, but NGC 281 is the most famous and one of the brighter ones. Uh, no, it won't look like that to your eyes unless you sprinkled something really special on your breakfast cereal. Uh, it is a, uh, a dim, ghostly glow in a larger instrument in dark skies. But this is charmingly known as the Pac-Man Nebula because the V shape of dust gives it the distinctive appearance of our favorite uh, ghost-eating entity of video games, the Pac-Man Nebula. Uh, one last thing I want to mention here, galaxies. We don't normally think of galaxies uh, in Cassiopeia, but there are two at the bottom of your diagram, NGCs uh, 185 and 147, and they have a connection to the constellation just to the south at the bottom of the diagram. That's where Andromeda is, and Andromeda is, of course, the famous Andromeda galaxy M31. Well, it turns out these are satellite galaxies of M31 just over the border into Cassiopeia, but they're actually orbiting it. Um, if you hunt down uh, NGC 147, that's the soft glow you're seeing there in your uh, telescope center, just slightly below center. This actually kind of captures what galaxies really look like through a telescope. They are not that obvious at first glance. They're soft, mysterious, ghostly glows. I really like what uh, Dave Nakamoto captured in that image there. And its companion, a little easier to see, NGC 185 here, uh, significantly brighter. Uh, for you astro imagers, if you want a challenge, notice at the center of this uh, little oval glow of millions of stars, there's a little dark patch 
a little bit of what we technically call schmutz, space schmutz, um, that little bit of dust floating in that galaxy, very unusual for an elliptical galaxy, which this is. So you might want to hunt for that or take an image of it. Um, so there's a summary of some of the kinds of things you can see in Cassiopeia, almost straight up, 9 o'clock, easy to find in a nice, bright, small pattern of sky. Um, wait till midnight. Uh, Cassiopeia is still up. It's up all evening. It's circumpolar. Um, Jupiter and Neptune have moved off to the west, but notice they're still around at midnight. You've got lots of time. Uranus at its best. Mars, very well placed by midnight. And of course, the moon's there too. Wait till five in the morning. Um, Jupiter has finally left the stage. Uh, Mars still well placed, even at 5 a.m. So you can make a complete night out of watching Mars. And by the way, Mars turns in 24 hours plus a bit. So remember, if you watched Mars all night long, you're going to see it rotate, right? So remember, every time you look into the sky, you're watching as the world turns. I'll leave you with one last image. Uh, yes, here is that famous Andromeda galaxy, almost straight up at 9 o'clock, 2.3 million light years away, one of our favorite things to look at. And there's plenty more out there for you to hunt down in the skies of November. And with that, I will return you to your previously scheduled program. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for yet another great What's Up. Totally enjoyed it. Uh, wonderful. Hi, my name is Reza, and I'm the vice president of the club. I, too, would like to welcome you to this meeting of the Orange County Astronomers on the 11th day of the 11th month of the second 11th year of the second century. Unfortunately, the speaker we had originally scheduled for tonight, Dr. Victoria Greenberg, has gotten COVID and is unable to make it. I'm hopeful that we can have her at a future meeting. However, luckily for us, we were able to secure another great speaker for tonight. Our speaker at this meeting is currently the director of SSC Observatories. Previously, he was the founder and president of Software Systems Consulting for 34 years. He's an engineer specializing in embedded systems design, robotics, remote sensing instrumentation, and signal processing hardware and software. He's a graduate of University of Michigan, uh, holding degrees in electrical and computer engineering. He holds over 15 patents in instrumentation and automation, and is the author of numerous articles in periodicals and refereed journals. Please join me in welcoming our very own John Hoot. John. Thank you very much, Reza. That was a very generous introduction. So um, while I can't tell you much about X-ray astronomy uh, tonight, I'd like to tell you about probably uh, the most important um, space telescope that you've hardly heard of, uh, and that is the Gaia telescope. And I'll see if I can share my screen here right now. And I th think you all, are you seeing? Yes, we can see your screen. All good. All right, good. I'm a little confused by the displays that I have on my screen, but as long as you see the right things, I'm good with that. Um, so almost 100 years ago, 99 years ago, all right, you see the slide on the left or the plate on the left, that was Hubble's discovery plate that proved that um, the Milky Way was not the entire universe, that in fact, the universe is full of Milky Ways. Um, and uh, it was the beginning of the bloom of cosmology. And for the, for the last 99 years, um, scientists have been avidly pursuing, um, discovering the structure of the universe, its expansion, um, the effects of general relativity, time, um, the expansion of the universe, its ultimate fate, its origins, 
um, cosmology has been the go-to, has been the, the red meat of astronomy for a hundred years. But, okay, in doing that, we've kind of overlooked something. And that is all those physics that are going on in all those other galaxies are going on in our very own. We've kind of neglected our own neighborhood. And Gaia is a telescope that uh, went to fix that problem. Uh oh, let's see if I can flip a slide. Are we you looking at a new slide? Yes, Gaia overview. Of Good. Objects. All right. So, Gaia is actually a, 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 tel a telescope and a satellite made by the European Space Agency. And it was a successor to um, uh, one called Hipparchos, but a much, much, much improved one. I mean, Hipparchos took um, parallax measurements so that we could put a third dimension to things. We could look in the sky and we could see where things were very precisely, but we had not a third dimension, how deep they are, how far away they are, how fast they're moving. We do get proper motion measurements um, as they were move perpendicular to our line of sight, but no depth, no velocity. And it characterized only 120 a uh, thousand stars, which for a galaxy our size is chunk change, um, but it was a start and it started to give us an idea of where we are in our galaxy and what's going on there. Gaia was the big bet to go big on the whole thing and its objectives are here, all right? Measure the position of one billion stars in our galaxy, okay? And the accuracy, this is an old slide, is down to seven micro arc seconds. That's some real fancy close resolution. And, all right, it wants to also take Hipparchos one further. Not only is it going to tell you how, how far things are, it's going to tell you how fast they're moving transversely to us. It's also going to give the radial velocities, the 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 rate at which it's moving towards or away from us. And it's going to measure the color and the temperature of all those stars, their absolute mass, and also their uh, spectral class, doing spectroscopy on them. And as an instrument designer, I think this is the most elegant space telescope flying today. It does all of this, okay? in a small compact telescope that was launched on a small Russian rocket and has absolutely no moving parts. That's, what, that's tricky. That's real tricky. This is how they did the magic, all right? On the left, you see there um, sort of an X-ray view of the satellite. The yellow stuff and the purple stuff and the orange stuff on the bottom, that's the spacecraft bus. That's the, the housekeeping. It does the, the, na the navigation, well, not the navigation, uh, the controls the orbit and the rotation of the satellite, its motion, okay? It also manages the electrical power, the communications, um, and the data processing. So it's, you know, it's the appliances that support the bluish thing on top, which is the actual instrument platform. And you can see that it looks kind of like a donut with a couple of ears on it, all right? Believe it or not, that is two half-meter class telescopes with a focal length of 35 meters sandwiched onto a spacecraft uh, fairing that would barely fit a Soyuz spacecraft. That's magic stuff. All right, now we'll get to that more later. Uh, on the bottom, on the right, it has this skirt that deploys, and that skirt um, is a sunshade and the power generator. All right, since it doesn't want to get solar glare in it, all right, it points that back end towards the sun, generates electricity, radiates the heat away, 
um, and allows it to operate in the near infrared uh, without any active cooling whatsoever. So here's how you squeeze a 35 foot long optical tube into a torus, all right? Each of those big ears on the top of it are in fact parabolic mirrors made out of fused um, silica, quartz silica, and of course ground to very high precision. And they reflect uh, light that comes into them into that ring where a collection of fused silica mirrors makes it run around in circles a couple of times both to get to travel 35 meters until it comes out through a, another mirror into the box here. I, I hope you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Um, yes. Down can. here on the bottom, this is the instrument package. All of these beams come together and end up um, in this box, which is the focal plane assembly containing 106 very large CCD cameras. The little box down here is an optical, some of the light gets diverted down into this box, which has some very sophisticated um, grisms um, and also does the spectroscopy, but brings it all to focus, all of the different instruments onto a single focal plane down here. Now, the magic in this thing is how do I image the whole sky with this thing? Well, the answer is I spin it, all right? I rotate it, and as I rotate it, it scans a complete circle out of the sky. And as we orbit the sun, all right, over the course of a year, it's gonna cover the whole entire sky. If you sort of think about that thing, not worrying about the, the distance to the sun, it basically rotates 360 degrees um, in, in this direction, if you will, um, in terms of looking at the entire sky over the course of a year. And with two different optical trains, all right, it scans the entire sky um, twice every annual year's revolution. So some and once you get this thing spinning, it's a gyroscope. It's self-stabilizing. And um, you get to phenomenal data. Here's the other really clever part of the thing, all right? There's no tracking required. This uses a method of measuring or imaging called time delay integration or drift scan. As this thing slowly rotates around, all right, what happens is the stars or galaxies or quasars or whatever they are drift across like this slowly. This is 10 seconds of motion over here. In 10 seconds, it moves across two chips, okay? Um, there are 106 of these chips and they are big chips. This thing is a meter in this direction and about half a meter in this direction. And so it takes like 120 seconds, 120 some seconds for a star to drift across this thing. And so CCDs are, are special in that the way you read them out is you shift down, or in this case, across, all right, to read them out. So if you clock the readout at the exact same speed the star is drifting, okay, it continues to integrate the whole time. And that moving integration finally ends up here coming out the other end, all right, reading out this in this direction. And the way they've done this is they, there are actually two different telescopes, all right, because we have two primary mirrors offset at 106 and a half degrees. So this half of the array up here is what one field of view looks like, and the other field of view illuminates this part of it. And then we've got some special ones here that do wavefront sensing and some of these other ones that, that do general sky uh, mapping and so forth. Now, these do, this section here is called the sky mapper. It's kind of the pretty picture piece. There are only two 
uh, two CCDs in this stack, but it's for course navigation, figuring out when you've got cosmic ray problems um, because they'll be able to propagate through the whole thing so you catch them early. Um, it also makes a course map of the sky for rough navigation. Um, and, um, and then these are the ones where, where the magic happens in the astrometry uh, that allows us to get that resolution for bright stars of seven micro arc seconds. But once we get through, and so those that data comes out this end of the pipe, all right. Then they took two columns here, all right, and they coded one blue and one red so that we would get differential photometry. By looking at the color indexes, we can figure out basically what the, the effective temperature, how hot is this star? So now we have distance astrometry, so we can convert the apparent magnitude into an actual magnitude. Because when you talk about stars, what you want to know is how, how massive they are, how luminous they are, and what temperature they are. That way you can classify them. Um, and so when you get, a, what you do is you take the apparent brightness, the brightness that we see, and then you factor in the distance. And basically it gets fainter in proportion to the square of the distance away that it is. So you pretend that each star is, is essentially at, at 10 parsecs. And it says, if I take this star and I move it to where it's exactly 10 parsecs away from me, how bright it is. That's called the absolute luminosity of a star. And that, in, when you know the, the, the luminosity of a star and its distance, you know its mass, you know its temperature, okay, you're, you're well on the way to, to knowing about all of the physics going on in that star, right? This is the other special one. This is the radial velocity uh, uh, spectrometer, which is a, a slitless spectrometer that all these stars drift through at the end of the pipe. And here's a map in wavelengths, all right, of what we information we get on each star that, or each object even that we look at. First of all, we measure in this green, but where's my cursor gone wild? The green bar is the total spectral response of the CCD, all right? That's what it, so we, we take every photon that the thing will get. And we use that um, to measure um, the brightness to the highest precision uh, that we can, all right? Then we divide it right down the middle, a filter that splits the blue and the red. And this goes out into the near infrared and tails off and up in the UV. And surprise, surprise, the only place they overlap is where um, the hydrogen alpha the uh, line is, all right? That's not an accident. Um, and then the spectrograph looks through a window in the near infrared. And that's where we learn to do spectral classification on the stars that come through our pipeline. And here is a series of um, spectra uh, from, the, from the Gaia telescope uh, for class of stars A, B, um, F, G, K, and M class stars. Oh, they didn't bother to show because it's not real interesting. And there aren't that many of them and they're bloody hot and they don't last long. Um, <clears throat> but you'll notice that the spectral band that they picked here from, from 8450 to about 8750, all right, has lots of wonderful spectral features. Uh, we'll start out here with sort of a, uh, an A or a, well, let's, let's look at a, a B class star, right? We've got four hydrogen lines in here, okay? We've got a helium line. Find out whether we're burning helium or not. And you see this one right here? Um, BE stars, certain B, e, certain B class stars have active uh, chromospheres or photospheres, and they generate emission spectra. And we will pick that up in this thing. And um, our good friend Carbon is here as well. And not only can you tell the composition of the star, you can tell the temperature of the atmosphere and radial velocity. The faster 
these Doppler shifts. So if we're looking, say, at, at this calcium line here, and that star is moving away from us, it's going to appear over here. And if it's moving towards us, it's going to appear over here. So by looking at the positions of the spectral lines, we can determine the velocity of the star along the line of sight. And by looking at the composition of the spectra, we can tell how hot the star is. And you look up here at some of these others, we also have five iron lines here. And when you want to find out um, how old the star is or how early it formed or how pristine the interstellar matter was from which it formed, all right, the very first stars that were formed were mostly hydrogen because there hadn't been other stars that had made heavier elements and exploded and thrown them back into the interstellar medium so that you built the new stars. So when you built those second generation of stars that had the debris from the first generation, all of a sudden you start to find elements which astronomers call metals, but metals anything that's not hydrogen or helium. Uh, yeah, we're not particular. Um, so, um, so we can look at um, the, the metallicity of a star and the metallicity of stars, if you model them uh, physically and you wanna look at how a star is going to evolve, it's important to know sort of what, in, it's like when you're making bread, you know, how much yeast did you put in, how many raisins, okay? Um, so the more iron in there, the more metal in a star, uh, it changes its evolutionary pattern. So you learn things about it. So the the, the calcium triplet that is in here is the best um, velocity measure in here. But we've also got hydrogen and um and uh, iron lines and some helium lines and throwing some silicon and stuff. And as you get to M-class stars, which are these very cool stars, um, and you don't see, well, you see some of these lines in there, but you also see molecular lines. Their atmospheres are so cool um, that the elements in there aren't just, um, the, we're not just looking at the electron transitions of um, atoms. We're now looking at the transitions and energy of molecules. So all of this um, in a platform, you know, that fits in a Soyuz-sized can, uh, spinning out there in space, and no moving parts. Uh, it's just the cleverest thing I, I've seen in a long, long time. So where do you put it to do the most good? All right. Well, just like the James Webb Space Telescope, you put it out at L2. L2 is, is a, an equilibrium point in the gravitational field around our sun. Um, and it's on a line site with the earth. So when you're at L2 and you put your sunshade this way and you put your radio antenna pointing in this direction, you're always shooting back to earth. So this thing is at basically 1.1, 1 .1, 1.01 um, astronomical units from the sun. And this isn't a stable point, but there's a, a figure eight shaped um, trajectory that you can follow that is almost a zero consumption. Um, it's called a lysiceris. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, but it's basically a figure eight. And it's doing figure eights here using hardly any fuel. And its rotation angle is roughly perpendicular to this line. And that's how we get coverage of the whole sky as it sweeps around the sun every year. So it's a very fuel efficient um, system, uh, requires very little energy in terms of propellant or, um, or um, mag, uh, gyrosco gyroscopes uh, in order to keep it pointed in a, in a good direction. And of course, you get the advantage of having the ability to, to send data back. And that's the other thing about this satellite. This satellite was designed, um, they, they beat the original specs, they beaten almost two to one uh, when they built it. They, they, really, they really nailed it. So um, it was supposed to provide four megabits per second data downlink, because as you can imagine, this thing is a fire hose, all right, uh, with 106, but you're only reading out 
what, one, two, three, four, five, six, six instrument readout points uh, with uh, seven CCDs full blast going all the time. Um, there's very little data processing on board. The idea was um, spend your money getting quality data and, and don't try and launch the computers, bring the data home and build a very big server farm, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, let me click here. All right, so here's the little Russian booster. You know, this looks like whatever the, you know, the, the Soyuz, they, they, they have a cargo fairing on it, but they just fit it in this little one and they launched it um, out, of, uh, out of Russia um, for the European Space Agency. The European Space Agency built this 100% themselves. All right. Um, well, we're building Hubble and JWST for pennies on the dollar. Uh, they built this. This was their answer. Let JWST discover the universe. We're going to discover what's in the backyard, and we're going to do it for pennies on the dollar. And that was brilliant, <laughs> quite simply. Um, they started work in 1993 on this thing. They went through a couple of design cycles, and it was good for them to do that. In fact, the initial Gaia name was um, with capital, all capitals. It was supposed to be something like uh, Galactic Astronomy Interferometric uh, Astrometry Satellite or something. But they've decided not to use interferometry. Instead, they decided to use parallax. But they they had so much documentation with Gaia in it that it was easier just to lowercase it and say, you know, Gaia, it's everything. Um, so that's the, the story of that. Um, and um, they don't depend on anybody else. Um, they have built ground stations just as the D Deep Space Network has around the world. Uh, they have one in Spain, they have one in Argentina, and they have one in Australia. All right, and that gives them 24 hour coverage, continuous coverage, eight, they, they achieve eight megabits per second these days with compression, better antennas and amplifiers on the ground than they had when they started the design. So the thing is, is constantly feeding eight megabits per second uh, down to earth. So the consortium of nations that built this, the European Space Agency included Britain, um, and uh, Germany, and uh, you can see all the dots here of the players that, that do this. And these are the data centers. They've, they've divided up the, the data centers uh, because processing this much data is a monumental tar uh, process. Um, the, the big one is in Strasbourg, um, and then there are facilities in Germany and so forth. Uh, Britain does work out of Cambridge. Uh, Spain does its processing. Um, well, that's the data center uh, where one of the ground links is, and then they've got another one. And they've divided up the workload. All right, this thing is is a fire hose of data, and this is the diagram that tells us where the data goes and how it gets processed. So uh, the initial look takes place um, in Strasbourg, and they look at that data stream. And they take a, as it goes by, they take a quick look for transients, okay? If we find a supernova, um, we find a transiting extrasolar planet, uh, we find a, a dwarf nova, we find a, a new asteroid, okay? That comes out of the pipeline and, and gets sent right away um, uh, to the people who are interested in it. Um, there's, of course, a bunch of IT housekeeping. Um, then there's three separate pipelines, photometry, all right? That's those red and those blue CCDs, trying to figure out the color index, all right? Then there's a group that does the astrometry, measures the precise position and proper motion of all these stars. And then there's the spectroscopy folks down here who are looking at the, that narrow band of spectra to see what kind of beast we're looking at and help classify it. And there is a giant data center, which is mirrored at least in a couple of places. Um, the numbers here are phenomenal. Um, then we get the people on the back end who access this database 
and then try and classify and catalog everything they've seen. And I hope I have a slide with catalog numbers, but I've got them on my top of my head if you're interested. Um, so the the program was was supposed to last until 2020, but it works so well, okay? Uh, it's going to run at least till 2025 now. Um, it's gone through three data releases now. Um, this, when I did this uh, about know, six, eight months ago, they hadn't released data release three yet. They'd done data release one. They'd done data release, release two. At data release one, two, pardon me, they had something like cataloged 1.1 billion stars uh, in our galaxy. All right. They are now at 2 billion. They've released data for 1.6 billion at this point. Um, and it, here's, here's a picture of the fire hose. Oh, good. I got some of the numbers here. Um, excluding solar system stuff, uh, data release two had uh, looked at 1.6 seven billion things of which they have astrometry on you know 1.3 billion uh they have position only on another 300 million or something like that um and then there are these two other things and that's something else i wanted to visit here before i run out of time and that is the previous astrometry missions used quasars to set the frame of reference all right Gaia has the ability to do that in their data processing stream, but they did not want to go in like Hipparchos with a with a, a a set of reference stars whose precision are far worse than their satellite. So another super clever thing they did is they basically processed the whole galaxy, and then sort of. Uh, I'm um, oversimplifying, centroided the whole damn galaxy and then nailed the frame of reference to that. So it's self-referential. It generates its own self-reference. Um, and um, it can be converted to anything else. Um, if you So you know its, its frame of reference and you can, its frame of reference relative to these other standards, you can move it around, but it generated its own frame of reference because you know, it's like trying to measure, um, trying to measure millimeters with a yardstick. You know, well, you know, the yardstick says it's you know we're plus or minus a yard because that's where our standards are. And the problem they had is there were no standards good enough um, for their resolution. Um, they've also um, since then done something. Um, they've discovered, um, well, not discovered. They've measured um, 160,000 of the, you know, 800,000 minor planets um, that we have, and uh, done the orbital mechanics on that. And I've got a slide on that down here. The other thing that you realize when you do this stuff, and I forgot to tell you in the spectroscopy, since you're looking in the near IR, and you know how bright that star is from its spectroscopy, you know its absolute magnitude. All right, and you know its distance, you look at your apparent magnitude and go, it's off by this much. Well, that's extinction by the interstellar media. So they're actually measuring the amount of dust and molecular material in three dimensions as well throughout our entire galaxy. They're doing so much physics with, you know, five simple instruments. They're, you know, they're playing a symphony uh, on five instruments here. So here are some of the numbers of, of things. All right, the, I screwed up here. Uh, the bottom legend should say magnitude. All right, um, and it will on one of these. But the total number of things recognized and measured in position is this top line here. And we're, we're well into the several billions, all right? This is the number of spectra we've taken. You know, we're only, you know, 100 million or so of those. Um, there, this is the radio velocities. Um, and while these numbers down here are not 
impressive in the sense that, oh, gee, we, you know, we, we lose it at 12th magnitude when we, we want to find, um, you know, a radial velocity. But the, that's 12 apparent magnitude. There's stuff bright enough in the outer halo of the galaxy that it is apparent at 12 magnitude. So, yeah, we can measure radial velocity of stuff all the way out to the edge of the, not all of it, okay? The faint stuff we're going to miss but we're getting a good outline all the way, in fact, to the small and large Magellanic clouds um, out of the thing. And then this is the stellar astrophysics that it's produced. Um, and look at the number of variable stars. <laughs> it's, you know, um, you know we're, we're somewhere around, you know, a million variable stars. Uh, I haven't done a, an inventory on VSX lately, but it's pretty sparse compared to a million stars. Uh, that I, there, I'm a variable star observer and modeler, okay? And that's why I got interested in this thing because it's, it's a game changer. Um, and then those of you who view double stars and you wanna know, yeah, are they gravitationally bound or are they just happen to be in the same? Well, now you've got the answer. You've got parallax distance, um, you've got, uh, and you have a proper motion and you have, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of, of what are, in fact, not single stars. In other words, these are the ones that they know are gravitationally bound. And we've observed them. So there's just tons of astrophysics going on here. Um, here's the one where I finally put in, this, <laughs> finally put in the, uh, the legend. Um, and these are things that are not stars. Okay, that, that have been measured. Um, and uh, those include finding, oh, you know, 100,000 uh, quasi-stellar objects, um, quasars. Yeah, yeah, they're out there. You know how many we know about? It's, it's a ridiculously low number. Um, galaxy candidates. Yeah, yeah, there are lots of galaxies out there. We kind of knew that. Uh, globular clusters that we've measured uh, out there, uh, you know, 10, 20,000, 30,000 globular clusters. Solar object transits, solar system object transits. That's our solar system, by the way. That's, that's nobody else's at the moment. Although they have developed a method using parallax to determine the orbital inclination of exoplanet stars. Um, they're the, the mathematicians here uh, make me feel inferior. Um, so here's something that a lot of people don't understand when they say, when they say here's Gaia data, okay? And they see this beautiful map of, of our galaxy in what's called the, the hammer projection, all right? Gaia doesn't take pictures, right? Each one of those dots in there okay, is a star measurement and a color and a temperature and a distance, all right? And there are literally, I think, 800,000 measurements. And when I say measurements, I mean for a star. There are actually four, three, four, five measurements for that star. So, you know, we're looking at, at 4 billion data points coming out of this, this machine. Now, something that you may have missed going back, and I won't go back for it, at the top of the slide that had the, the information about the, um, the design of the telescope, there is no data embargo. All of the information that Gaia has comes in is available as it comes in. You can access every step of that pipeline online, live. If you've got the, the bandwidth and you want to download a million stars, you can do it. It's all open. The database is full free access. And here's an example, all right? What we've got over here is your classic HR diagram, except this one is the one on the left and the one on the right, all right? 
The one on the left was in the um, Astrophysical Journal's um, release, uh, data release three um, paper. There was an early data release three. It was June of this year was when uh, the third data release was actually formally released. This paper was published. This is an HR diagram from all the stars in our galaxy, all right, that they've imaged, that they've measured, all right? And for those of you who aren't astrophysical nerds, okay, this is the main sequence right here. This is, this is the hydrogen burning sequence. And then when you get to a, a certain point here, all right, um, you, you basically are, if you're a larger or massive enough star, you move off into helium burning and off into the asymptotic branch and then back up and back down and then you blow up. Okay, so it's, a, it's a tough deal, but it, you know, it's the way the cookie crumbles. Down here, this is stuff that, that is little tiny dwarfs that haven't even started burning and, and migrated their little selves onto the main sequence yet. Down here, these are the burnouts, okay? These are the white dwarfs. These are the ones that have uh, spent their wad and uh, they burned everything that they can burn right up to iron. And, and then the music stops and they turn into basically a very hot diamond <laughs> that radiates very slowly because it has no surface energy. And these guys out here are asymptotic red giants that are going to backtrack and go up here. And these are the little guys that just keep on plugging until they run out of poop. So that's the HR diagram, all right? And this is the one that, that has, you know, a billion data points in it. And the color indicates the density of stuff. Um, so the, the brighter it is, the more luminous it is, the more... Um, stars occupy the region. This is a guy, a Russian, who said, well, what the heck? I'm going to download a million stars, okay? And I'm going to plot it myself. And this was his result. And what he was looking at was stellar, he's got stellar density here to a higher degree of resolution than they do, but he has the exact same diagram. And if you look here, He's, he's got absolute magnitudes, and they line up perfectly, of course, with this other one. Now, he doesn't have effective, uh, he doesn't have luminosity over here, and he doesn't have effective temperature, okay? He just looks at the color index, right? But it's the same diagram. This is, you know, do it yourself at home with your laptop, and maybe a day's worth of downloading. Um, Here's a look at um, some of the physics that, that fall out of this thing, all right? On the right, this is an HST image of 47th Uconus, a huge globular, old globular cluster, uh, only visible in the Southern Hemisphere. I was actually, I, I, I've had 24 hours to freshen this proposal since I got called to make the talk. Um, and it, just by chance, I was imaging uh, three nights ago, uh, 47th Uconus, um, on a telescope I have time on down in Chile. So uh, this is, that's why this one got thrown in. But um, this is um, the kind of thing where you can measure the age of a globular cluster <clears throat> by looking for this turnoff point. At what magnitude does it turn off? Because the, 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 the higher the magnitude, the lower the magnitude, the bigger the star. Okay, it's backwards, I don't know why. Um, but that means it burns out faster. So all the things that were more massive than this have already moved off into the, the giant branch for their final demise. The stuff down here is still burning in the main sequence. And when you look at the absolute magnitude at which it turns off, you can figure out how old it is. Now, that's influenced by its um, ratio of, of iron to, to hydrogen. And this, this is something you can do in 15 minutes. Pull out 21,580 stars out of the Tucanus area, all right, and make sure that they're all at the right distance to be a mem member of the, of the cluster, and then you plot them. And if you add the metallicity to it, the plot, you discover that 
that in fact, this is two globular clusters that have come together, that these blue ones, okay, are on a slightly different path and have slightly different metallicity. Um, and you color them appropriately for their radii and you discover, oh, well, these are two that got together. Interesting stuff. Here is a look at, um, synthesized of course, of the 160,000 um, asteroids we've looked at. And look at this, this is, this is Jupiter. You can see the Trojan asteroids. These are the ones that are in the, the Lagrange, you know, three or four points that are hanging around. Um, you wanna talk about sensitivity, accuracy? This is a map of the amount of light bending that happens due to general relativity looking back through our solar system, okay? So the sun is the big boy right here, okay? Up here, pardon me, this is the sun right here, okay? Um, this is Venus, how much it bends the light. Um, this Saturn was over here at the time, okay? Um, and uh, Neptune is this little blip over here. Um, but we're, these are, this. what are the units of this thing? Uh, did I not get the units again? Oh, micro arc seconds. That's, this is, that's, that's what we're looking at. And you have to, when you're doing this calculation, you have to compensate for that while you're doing the data reduction. If you haven't got a headache yet, you're taking better meds than me. All right. This is the measurement of the density of the interstellar media as one moves away from the sun. And this gives you the velocity flux of the interstellar media um, as it moves away, as this thing goes out. This is an animation that, that's measuring at, in just one plane of, of, our, of our sun, of our solar system, the interstellar reddening out to um, uh, four kiloparsecs plus or minus in both directions. But we have this data for all the planes all over the sky. And um, this is an animation, I hope, um, that shows you um, computationally the L interstellar medium. Um, this is zooming in on our sun. That's where we are. We're out in the, in the boonies in, a, in an arm. And here is uh, looking down on the, the distribution of the interstellar media. And then we're gonna zoom in and uh, level out in the plane and look at the stuff and kind of smooth it a little. And then we're gonna pan around and look at the density of the interstellar media uh, in the plane of the Milky Way around our, around our sun. So uh, if you wanna calculate that differential uh, you know, extinction, um, here's what it is and where it is and how much it is and how far it is, because that's the other thing you have to know here. My, if my object is only, you know, two kiloparsecs out, I, I need to integrate only out that far. This is a map that says, you know, if you're looking, trying to look all the way through what goes on. I'm running a little short of time, so I'm going to stop this one and hopefully get to the next one. Um, the other thing you can do is we've got a time machine. All right, if you know the mass, the direction, the velocities um, of the stars, okay, you can run the movie forwards and backwards. So here is the, that's supposed to be our sun. Um, it's, a, it's, it's not to scale, all right. But these are all the stars around us, all right. Now, if you look, there are some that are moving really fast, those are foreground stars for the most part. And of course the stuff moving slower is in the background. Although that's not always the case. Ooh, that, what, what was that one just went by? All right, so now here's the bad news, okay? I am a gypsy. I'm going to tell you your fortune. This is um, the entire solar system, including the Oort cloud, all right? And we're running this animation forward about 2.3 billion million years, pardon me, 2.3 million years. And you'll notice that there is this star coming through our Oort cloud. 
in 1.29 million years. And it's, it's Glisse uh, 710. And if you um, have studied uh, craters and so forth, there was a period of, of heavy bombardment in our early solar system. And one of the hypotheses was that a star flew through our Oort cloud and our Kuiper belt and dislodged a bunch of stuff and it rained bad news down on uh, all the planets and may have even caused some of them to switch their orbital um, positions. So, um, you know, write a note, put it in a bottle for, for those that are around in 1.29 billion years and tell them to build a bomb shelter. All right. I've got about five minutes left here. Um, this is the point. This is all free. This, this, you can do this. I did this this afternoon, okay? All right, the catalogs are av available. Easiest access is through a portal called Vizier. Um, if you know about it or if you don't, uh, Google it. It's just an interactive thing and you can, all these sub catalogs, you know, radial velocities, uh, Cepheids, uh, Lyries, uh, short period variables, transits, uh, you know, solar system objects, et cetera. Uh, you, can, you can pull this data out. You can query by position, galactic position, distance, color index, all those sorts of things. This is a query form, the kind of thing that you fill out to do it. There's an easier way to do it. It's an application called TopCat, all right? Tool for operations on catalogs and tables. And it incorporates a virtual observatory and a plotting package, and it uses a, a, a variant of SQL, if any of you are database geeks, and it's called basically ADSQL or ADQL. And you can write a query language, and you can merge data from multiple different catalogs and then create visualizations from them on your computer. So I took a quick run through it, and I said, okay, let's figure out the Pleiades. All right, they're up now, might as well do it. All right, so I go to Gaia and I make this projection of, of relative motion, proper motion, all right, uh, over the vicinity of the Pleiades. And I see, you know, this section over here, that's pretty much our sun and our solar system moving through stuff. But this thing down here is doing something different. I'll bet that's the Pleiades, all right? So I literally graphically draw a circle around it and say, plot just this stuff for me. And, uh, you know, look, look at the distribution of things. And sure enough, you know, it's, it looks like the, the parallaxes. I, I'm plotting the parallax here. Are these all, they're all moving in the same direction. Are they at the same distance? Or, all right. The answer is yes. And it's a nice Gaussian distribution, which makes some sense. All right, great. Now, the fact of the matter is, you know, Pleiades is everything at fifth magnitude or better. Maybe, you know, depending on your, or we'll, we'll go six or eight, okay? But, you, you know, we, we look at the big five, four or five stars and we go, yeah, wow, yeah. And look at that interstellar stuff. Ooh, look at the goo around there. All right. But if you look at this distribution of, of magnitudes, there are a bunch of much fainter, smaller, lower mass stars that are part of the Pleiades. And this is the plot of those stars. It's a much bigger cluster than you think it is. And you go further, okay? And oh, why don't we throw out the HR diagram? Yep, they all lie on the same path. They're all, they're all kin. Uh, how many did I have? I think 425 members. Oh. That was the size of this sample. It's in here somewhere. Uh, count, 814 stars um, out, of, uh, the, uh, out of the original query. I had uh, 248,000 stars. Uh, and when we were done sifting through the data, we had 814 members of the Pleiades. And this took me about an hour to do. And that's the kind of thing. And that's just the beginning. That's using the interactive GUI. I, I didn't write a line of code to do that. This is the, the, the big boys way to do it and girls. And that is, this is a, a, a derivative of SQL and you can, you can do serious astrophysics here. That's all, you know, whatever it is you're looking for, um, this is the way you sift it out of, 
of literally hundreds of billions of, of operations. And here's a couple of sample scripts. I'm not going to let your eyes glaze over doing that. Um, and new discoveries are here, okay? Uh, yeah, it's a cloudy night. What are you going to do, all right? Well, this is a good place to play if, if you're so inclined. And here's just a couple of the things that I throw out there that just going through here that I thought might interest you, like use white dwarfs to determine the history of star formation in the Milky Way, right? They're all ancient cinders, okay? And their temperatures tell you how long they've been cooling off and we know what mass and what distance they're at. So now let's look at the distribution of those and um, we'll, we'll, we'll have epochs of star formation that we know about, all right? How common are spectroscopic binaries? Uh, how similar are they in their, their chemistry and their ages? Separating double stars from binaries, I showed you that already. They've, they've done the heavy lifting there. Um, use parallax to determine the binary stars' in, uh, inclinations. You can measure it um, doing double star modeling, uh, and this is a sanity check because there are so many um, different control variables, more than there are answers that you're going to get. Um, so help you better model binary stars. You can start, explore star formation. Uh, we now have big population of young stellar objects out there, down there in the lower part of that HR diagram. We know where they are now. And we know where they are in their evolution. So we can look at that. Uh, determine the density and position of interstellar dust from standard candles and parallax. And what that's about is, all right, maybe we, we solve the, the, the Hubble argument, all right? Right now, um, the standard candles and the, the, the microwave anisotropy folks don't agree on what the Hubble constant is, all right? Now, the question is, how standard are our standard candles, all right? We've been saying that this Cepheid is this far away and this RR library is that far away based on this stuff. Now, we can take the, the literature stuff and look at relative to the parallax and see, does it match? Or if it doesn't match, how do we adjust the model and what does that do to our estimation of the Hubble constant? So there's some, some big time cosmology to be done here too. Um, solve eclipsing binaries without the need of, of spectroscopy. All right, it's um, the, there's two guys, Wilson and Davini, who've done sort of the definitive work on modeling binary stars. And the idea was you could measure um, their um, eclipsing light curves and determine their relative ma masses and orbital um, periods uh, and their mass ratios, uh, but you couldn't get their absolute mass unless you did spectroscopy. But, you know, we can turn the math inside out. If we know the distance, then we can determine their absolute magnitudes and we don't need the spectroscopy. So if you're modeling binary stars, Gaia is a game changer for you. Star clusters, what are the mass distributions? What determines their rate of dispersion? Um, where are the sun's siblings? They should have near zero relative motion to us, okay? We formed in a cluster somewhere long in, a, in this galaxy a long, long time ago. Um, so therefore, we need to go search out the, our zero relative magnitude siblings, okay? And do a little DNA testing with the spectrograph and, and find out where the family came from. All right, it's, it's star genealogy, folks. Stellar seismology, uh, find populations of stars with same initial masses and metallicity, and as they move to the um, instability strip, look at how their pulsations evolve, all right? We don't know. Uh, you look at the instability strip, and we don't understand how the modes evolve and over what time and what they're telling us. Uh, but we can, with enough work, uh, with the Gaia data. And then brown dwarfs. Clusters should have them in abundance. We should find them by searching, and, you know, those, those young clusters and uh, with the infrared side of things and look for those really, really, really cool red stars. And then call on JWST to, to clean up after us. So those are just, you know, I throw on the spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks. So if you want to learn more about Gaia, Here's some places to start, um, and it's a, it's a game changer in astrophysics. It can turn uh, us casual um, observational astronomers into astrophysicists. It's a frightening prospect. That's, that's what I got. 
So, John, are we going to post that someplace so we can go back to the resources? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll post that. I don't know where. Um, maybe in the astrophysics group. You got? Do they have a chat? Reza? Yes, they do have a mailing list, and also we could put this on the website. So what an amazing talk, John. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh there is a lot, and uh, you did that all uh, well in the last minute. Uh, we really appreciate you filling in and doing this amazing talk. It's all uh, great about knowing uh, what's going on with Gaia and uh, fabulous. So let me tell everybody that uh, the floor is open for questions. Uh, please use the Q&A uh, button on your screen to uh, send uh, John your questions. And... Uh, you showed us, John, uh, some very nice aspects of this uh, thing, like, uh, for example, uh, spotting uh, in two million years, if I'm not mistaken, that the star is going to go uh, past by the solar system. Uh, so how, uh, out of this huge catalog, that star was uh, was pinpointed? Uh, well, can you tell uh, us a little bit about these search methods okay. and stuff? Yeah, well, all right. So the the researchers that, that found it, all right, first of all, Glisse is a catalog of nearby stars. We we knew that already. The their parallaxes are large enough, their proper motions are par, are close enough and so forth. That it's a very nice catalog of um, of bright nearby stars. So if something's gonna run into us in the near future, it's gonna have to be relatively close. So they basically took Gliese and they put it through the, they pulled the full Gaia data for it that gave them the kinematics of where it's going. And then they just ran the simulation forward and backward to see if, if we'd had a drive-by earlier. Um, and um, and the winner was uh, Gliese 710. Um, and it's 1.29 million years. So mark it on your calendar. It should, it should be interesting. It'll be a really bright star. I so, probably won't recognize the sky. Yeah, we we have uh, we thought that uh, we would be in trouble in four billion years when the sun is going to uh, change its uh, phase, but now it looks like the danger is much closer to us. Uh, well, I so mean, uh, assuming our species would last, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, 1.2 billion years, I don't know, you know, it, or it's a million. I, I better go back and look up my numbers. I'm not sure whether it's a billion or million. In any case, um, by then, either we've moved on or um, we should have the technology to, to at least to deflect the big chunks. Sure. Uh Chris, do you have a question uh, uh, from John? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, Tonight, time well spent. Um, I, I mean, I, I knew about Gaia. I knew a bit about its capabilities. Uh, this was a very good talk to go over everything I knew and go way beyond it in its capabilities. Um, yeah, this, real, this is an eye-opener. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled uh, with the implications here. Uh, Gosh, all the things we can find out. Uh, is Alpha Centauri including Proxima? We we could do it with this kind of data. I just, there's so much I hadn't thought of. Uh, I, um, yeah, I, I can't thank you enough, John. This is just remarkable. Well, that, that was an eye opener for me when I started digging into it. Yeah. You know, the, the the big boys have been looking at the, at the entire cosmos, but yeah. as, a, as a small telescope scientist, okay, um, right. I'm pretty much limited to to the own my own galaxy. So while they're out ex exploring the universe, okay, we small guys at home now, you know, there, there's no physics happening in other galaxies that isn't happening somewhere here. And sure. now we can find it. Indeed, and good for them not putting an embargo on it because there's so many places where people do hold the data to themselves. I'm I'm really glad to know they're sharing it the way they are. Liberté, equality, yes. You're here. Okay, we got some other questions here. 
Yes, sure, John. Uh, so somebody wants to know if there has been any black holes discovered uh, from the binary orbital data. Uh, um, that's a, a good question. Um, basically, of course, black holes being black, uh, Gaia isn't going to see them, but we should be looking for vortices of stars. Uh, and that's a search uh, that uh, maybe somebody's doing, but certainly someone should be doing. Uh, and what you want to do, of course, is, is be looking at, at areas of relatively dense star um, populations uh, and looking for ones that, that are basically orbiting nothing. Um, and that's an interesting query to try and figure out. But um, if that is how you can discover them in, in Gaia, the, the information is there. The trick is to um, find a group of stars and they have to be pretty close together um uh i'm thinking of, you know it, it would here's the the acid test we know where the massive black hole is in the center of our galaxy thanks to um andreas what, what's it what, you know the g just won a nobel prize whatever andrea um, guess this yeah or just yeah. Yeah. um Go look look there in the Gaia data and see what it tells you. And if it can find a supermassive one, uh, then you uh, and you look at the, the resolution that you have to spare in those measurements, then you can scale what size of black hole you can discover from Gaia data. And so that will bound your search. Thank you. And uh, for those who joined us a bit later, uh, can you tell us what Gaia uh, stands for? Originally, it stood for something like Galactic Astronomy Interferometric Astrometry Satellite. But they did a design review and this design one hands down, and it's not interferometric, it's parallactic but they didn't want to change all their, their literature. So they, they lowercase the, the AIA into Gaia, which is a sort of an inclusive uh, sur survey. Um, they're as clever with their acronyms as they are with their spacecraft design. Yeah, I, I've seen some other projects similarly like CERN. Uh, so now there is a question about uh, JWST, uh, James Webb Space Telescope, and so somebody wants to know uh, if uh, funding for that project, for JWST, uh, caused any other similar, uh, perhaps American, uh, projects to be killed. Well, without getting too political, it ate the NSF budget for about a, two decades. Um, there, um, virtually all the meter class telescopes that were operating at Kitt Peak and around the world, uh, which were producing, frankly, the most PhD uh, candidates and, and theses and so forth, are all but closed because the the money went to JWST. That's that's the impact. Um, you know, situations evolve and you adapt. And the surveys are filling some of that gap. Um, however, there are things that need high cadence observations where you park on it and look at it for a long time. And that's frankly where the small telescope community comes in. I operate um, four telescopes on two continents that are robotic. Um, I would run tonight, but I thought maybe better of it. Um, but uh, Typically, each one of those scopes is dwelling on a single target, you know, for four or five days consecutively. All right. So that I get the, the cadence of the surveys it runs from two per day to, you know, every every week. All right. Well, for a short period and transients and stuff, um, that's insufficient to characterize what's going on. And that's where uh people with in scientific inclination and a small telescope can make a contribution just by by concentrating on those kinds of targets so the the nature of observing has changed all right uh, i mean gaia is a, a beautiful example and and wait till um 
uh, LSST, the Vera Rubin telescope comes online. Uh, that's the next fire hose. Um, and, and that will be, now it is not gonna have the positional accuracy um, that Gaia has, not even close, uh, but it is gonna cover everything at a reasonably high cadence um, in well, um, well-designed band passes. Uh, it's gonna produce a lot of data, but there are a lot of other surveys that, that are uh, out there as well. So um, the notion that you need a telescope to do your observations, depending on what your hypothesis is and what your what your experimental design is. And you should blend your experimental design to the resources you have access to if you wanna be successful. So the observing scene has changed as a result of funding that went into JWST, uh, but that does not discourage uh, clever and inventive uh, astrophysics students from finding their way th through to, um, to interesting discoveries. Perfect, thank you. Um, and now a more technical question. Uh, you mentioned about Gaia uh, doing a self-reference uh, to orient itself. Can you explain a bit more about uh, what that is and how that works? I wish I could. Um, I haven't del de delved deeply enough into that paper. I understand from an engineering point of view why they did it, okay? Uh, because frankly, they were going to their instrument was going to be more precise than any of the standards against which they wanted to, you know, they needed to to anchor um, their observations. Um, but the process by which they do that, okay, and how they reconcile that with the existing archival data, I haven't gotten into the papers and, and gotten into the math, but I am certain. Um, it's it's basically a, a giant mesh um and um and that's mesh not mess um and uh the the solution to that needs not to flex beyond the precision of the movements that they're seeing and beyond that i don't know the math they used thank you thank you now here here is a question uh, for those who are interested in extraterrestrial uh, intelligence, and it's uh, about Dyson sphere. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dyson sphere is an idea that uh, suf uh, sufficiently sophisticated uh, civilization will be able to harvest the energy of their host star uh, by putting some uh, sort of panels or um, energy harvesting things around their stars and then survive that way. So here's the questioner, questioner's question, uh, John. Uh, would Gaia be able to uh, detect if any stars have a Dyson sphere around them? Uh, um, well, the answer would be the star would certainly have an anomalous um, spectra um, uh, distribution. Uh, and have, uh, because they were harvesting the energy, a much lower effective temperature um, than uh, its mass would indicate. Now, in order to determine its mass, you can't use conventional mass luminosity relationships. You would have to use gravitational interactions with stars around it, which were not enclosed in Dyson spheres. Um, so uh, theoretically, uh, if they were close enough and they had um, harnessed enough of the energy from their star, it would appear as an anomalous data point. Now, whether it's a Dyson sphere or something more peculiar or with a, with a dust cloud around it or whatnot would be probably pretty hard to distinguish. It certainly would be an anomalous data point, but uh, that there's a long leap from anomalous data point to Dyson sphere. Thank you. And uh, this question, the next question, does not uh, directly involve uh, Gaia, but uh, since you did mention that the next game changer is going to be the Rubin Observatory, uh, and nowadays we have launch of a lot of uh, satellite constellations, uh, wouldn't that badly affect Rubin? Uh, that's the question. Well, um, the answer is it will affect Rubin. Um, 
I, I confess that my, my brightest nephew um, just went to work for Starlink about six months ago. And I sent him a congratulations card and a can of black paint, literally, uh, as a joke. Um, but um, they, he in particular and others are working with um, LSST and PanStars and some of the other surveys um, and, and helping them, well, providing them with ephemerities such that they can plan their search grid to avoid uh, the worst of it. But they're also gonna have to mitigate it um, by uh, recognizing and eliminating uh, satellite tracks from their, from their images. It is going to affect them. Um, how much? Um, I've heard estimates ranging from, I don't believe at 50%, down to 10 to 15%, which I think um, is probably closer to the truth. And um, I've already seen papers being produced on how to recognize and um, uh, mark satellite tracks so that the data is not incorporated into survey pipelines. And that's probably the, the practical solution in the long run, particularly since uh, not all satellite constellation owners, including the US Space Force, um, are gonna tell them when things are coming by. Right. Um, let's hope for the best then. Uh, and thank you very much. So uh, that covers all the questions. Uh, let me see if anybody else from the panelists have any other questions. Oh, I, I do. Um, Go do, ahead, Kim. Uh, will the astrophysics special interest group still be meeting at the Heritage Museum? Uh, yes, their meetings uh, are happening in person. And uh, at the moment, our website uh, is down, unfortunately. Uh, but then, yeah, the information about uh, the meeting of astrophysics group will be on the website on the calendar section uh, for those who are interested. And uh, so as a last point, let me emphasize that, uh, as John mentioned, the Gaia database is freely available online. And uh, you all you need uh, is just uh, maybe a software uh, that you could use to uh, process the data as you wish. And uh, John uh, introduced TopCat. Uh, there are many others, uh, depending on what kind of research you want to do. Uh, and uh, one of the best research that actually uh, you can do, and John demonstrated that beautifully, is uh, recreating an HR diagram. Um, it took you just one hour, John, right? Yeah. And uh, so uh, you could recreate that, and it has a lot of educational value. And then uh, you could, uh, you know, these simple things, and then you could also do uh, you could go as complicated as uh, you can and uh, the links are here and uh, we'll manage to put that the uh, resource things on the website and uh, the recording of this video will also be uh, available uh, on our YouTube channel um, so with this uh, John do you have any final remarks before I close the meeting no I pretty much uh, spent my fury for tonight perfect ah one more thing uh, if anybody needs any kind of uh, guidance on how to deal with this, will be will you be available for consultation? Sure, drop me an email. Perfect. Bye. Thank you Emails very on much. The back of the serious astronomer. astronomer. Yeah, so you could find John's email address on the back of the serious astronomer, and also on our website and the contact section. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, attending. Um, please check the calendar on our website for all our upcoming events at ocastronomers.org. I would like to thank everybody for joining us and wish you great times ahead. Bye-bye.